everyone. Um, thank you all for tuning in tonight. I'll keep letting people in as they trickle in. Um, we are very grateful to have Carson Kuman and Brenda Portman with us tonight. Uh, I'm going to just turn it right over to them and let them get going. So Carson, I'm going to spotlight your video here. Hopefully that will work. And the floor is yours. And, and also, everybody, if you have questions, um, Carson and Brenda said you can ask them as we go. So just um, there's that little icon. You can raise your hand if you just want to do that. And then we'll call on you as they come. Carson, here you go. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, as said, my name is Carson Kuman. I am the uh, composer in residence at the Memorial Church at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and also the uh, organ editor at Lorenz Sacred Music Press. Uh, today, Jim has asked uh, both Brenda and me to speak about our, uh, our own organ compositions a bit and just perhaps sort of in words and the scores on screen a little bit uh, introduce introduce some pieces. Uh, so uh, I, I've prepared a handout file which you can see there. If you open that up, um, you'll be able to uh, see a sort of, I made a sort of selected sampling of, of some publications, mostly of recent vintage uh, broken out into Rough, very roughly. Difficulties are always hard to pin down exactly, uh, but sort of broken out into rough difficulties levels ranging from uh, very easy to advanced. And uh, I will just speak about a few of the few of the things uh, within each of those categories, and I'm happy to answer um, any questions or any uh, further things that come up. Uh, all the pieces have been recorded in one way or another. Um, there's a, a series of CDs that have been produced by various performers, uh, mostly Eric Simmons, um, uh, that is, I think, at 14 or 15 volumes uh, so far on Divine Art uh, Records of my uh, complete organ music. Uh, and there are also many demo recordings online on my website and elsewhere. So if you have an interest in what any particular piece sounds like, there's usually a fairly easy way to find that out. Um, so let's start with, let me turn on the screen sharing then now, Jim. All right. <clears throat> So beginning in the uh, easy lower intermediate collection, we'll start with the first item listed there, Cambridge Port Collection, uh, which is a, uh, it's, not a it's not a suite, it's, it's a collection of uh, 17 uh, individual small works of various sorts, uh, some of which are suitable particularly for smaller organs or uh, inspired by historical uh, models or styles. A number are for manuals only, some have pedal, and they are mostly of fairly, fairly easy difficulty um, through here. There's a, a variety of things. There's a few uh, pieces inspired by old English voluntary styles. Other, uh, some other varied, varied works, both quiet and loud. Uh, some pieces in, uh, inspired very much by, by uh, early styles. Some of the pieces with four manuals have opportunities for optional pedal as well. And then some of the works have obligatory, obligatory pedal. Uh, the difficulty level overall is, is generally fairly easy and the pieces are fairly short. Within that same category, uh, Kennebunkport Suite, which is the second one under the top there. Uh, this is a piece, this was written for the a, a dedicate, a, I guess rededication of a restored uh, one manual hook organ in uh, Kennebunkport, Maine. Um, and these are three preludes on uh, early American hymns uh, foundation Bethany and uh, Land of Rest, uh, originally written so that they can be played on a single manual organ with divided stops, although very, 
very easy. In fact, easier to play them with two manuals than you don't really have to change registration much at all. Um, but suitable for, for any particular size instrument and also of, of, uh, of uh, not, not of advanced difficulty at all. Another work within that same category, the easy lower intermediate is a ceremonial suite. This is a set of three movements um, that I originally wrote for my brother's wedding. Uh, a processional movement uh, that has optional repeats in it to extend the length as needed. Yeah, solo and accompaniment quiet aria. And then a, a joyous postlude that also has a, a somewhat uh, modular form that could be uh, repeated as as needed. Also, not not of uh, not of uh, advanced difficulty certainly. Moving down into the uh, intermediate category. <clears throat> We'll look at a, a collection called Antiphonies that's published by Lorenz Sacred Music Press. <clears throat> this is a sort of mixed book that contains, uh, here's the contents list, contains a, a, a mix of both free pieces and uh, hymn-based works of various sorts, pastoral, prelude, um, aria, processional, hymn-based music, and then the final work is a set of three uh, hymn-based pieces, um, unified not by season, uh, but, but by the fact that all of their, the titles of their most common text begin with the words come or oh come, um, just an interesting idea that was suggested to me by the person that commissioned it. So there's a setting of Nettleton, come the fun of every blessing, uh, Vani Emanuel, come come Emanuel, and then uh, Vani Creator Spiritus, come Creator Spirit. Again, mostly um, not, not, there's a few things that are a little more difficult than the uh, items in the previous category, though still not, still not particularly, particularly hard. Uh, there, this is, this is a fairly large category on this sheet, um, on this list here, you see listed a number of number of collections, some I won't necessarily show here. There's a, a, a somewhat similar concept volume called Expressions that was released um, earlier this year by Karos Verlag. Again, sort of a mix of hymn based pieces and, and original works. Uh, Organ Works Volume 8, which is at the top of the second page, uh, is a, another collection of pieces that uh, are contemporary works that have strong inspiration from, from early music. <laughs> Uh, St. Francis Organ Book is a collection of several works that are all inspired by uh, the life and writings about uh, St. Francis. There are uh, several sort of general pieces, uh, pieces on the plain chants for his day. And then the last piece is, is three very uh, sort of very descriptive, almost programmatic movements uh, describing three of the stories from the Fioretti, the, the collection of stories about the life of St. Francis, him divesting himself of his worldly wealth, the uh, extremely famous sermon to the birds, and then finally him uh, calming the wolf of Gubbio uh, by uh, convincing it to no longer attack the, uh, attack the village. Um, we've just passed St. Francis Day, obviously. Um, but uh, these are useful for recitals or events connected to that, or just really in general. Continuing down in this category, there's uh, five festive organ pieces, sets one and two. These are two, two volumes um, containing pieces that are um, sort of a postlude length, about three, three to four minutes of. Uh, of various sorts, um, two volumes of those, and then six quiet organ pieces, which is a sort of foil uh, volume. Again, about three to five minutes each, uh, four preludes or offertories. Um, 
several other items listed in this category, Gregorian diptych, uh, two plain chant based pieces of exactly contrasting character, adora, a quiet lyrical adorote, and then a, uh, a fast da pacem domine. Um, my second organ symphony is included in this category. It's a not of particularly demanding work on a technical level. Uh, it's a 12 thematically linked short movements that can be played uh, on any, any size organ, really, um, as long as you have a pedal board and, and one manual, um, right up to a very large cathedral organ. There's a lot of flexibility built into the uh, registration and concepts. It's been recorded uh, several times with very large organs, uh, but also can be done successfully. And then uh, last thing listed in this category, trilogy on BACH, um, sort of my contribution to the glut of pieces that exist on that uh, motive. Uh, I try to approach it a little bit differently. Most BACH pieces are extremely contrapuntal um, in style, sort of get clotted up in themselves in the chromatic counterpoint. And these three pieces go very much in the other direction, um, um, using the, the motive very much uh, motivically and as a sort of development motive from that, not. So there's, there's no fugue for sure in there. <laughs> Just looking at the next category, upper intermediate, lower advanced. There is um, volume 10, uh, uh, was from a collection volume published by uh, Wayne Leopold Editions. This volume contains uh, a, a series of different pieces, nine uh, preludes and fugues, some of which are for manuals only, some of which uh, have optional pedal and some have obligatory pedal, uh, a series of canzonas, and then uh, several several Christmas pieces. Uh, again, the, dip the difficulty level rises rises a bit. Um, sort of move through these items. Uh, the Christmas pieces are not not particular at the end are not particularly difficult. Partida on uh, infant holy infant lowly the Polish carol. Um, and then a little post loot on Dolce U below. Um, looking also in this category, Toccatas and Flourishes is a collection of uh, two Toccatas and three Flourishes, all about three to four minutes. The Toccatas are extremely fast, and the Flourishes are also are loud as well, but, uh, but broad. Um, and then just some other works listed there, Rhapsody in A, uh, Organ Symphony Number no. 3, uh, which is five movements uh, inspired by scripture, several other works. And then finally, uh, the, there's an advanced category with a few, a few works of, of uh, significantly greater difficulty. My first Organ Symphony, a piece called Rhapsody, and then a piece called The Forest for the Trees um, that's a, a bit more towards the avant-garde end of things. This is a sort of pull out of, of some selected things. I have written about a, somewhat more than 300 organ pieces at this point, um, and they're uh, collected into a variety of different volumes. Some are published separately, some are published individually, um, so there's a variety of things. My website has a searchable database as well as a variety of categorized lists to uh, try and help someone make sense of um, how many pieces there are. And of course, I'm always perfectly happy to answer questions if people have uh, specific needs and other times you're welcome to, to write to me <coughs> and to ask. <coughs> and as I said, everything is, everything is recorded, so, uh, so widely, widely and easily available to listen to, uh, listen to the various works. So I think that covers a few of the recent things. I'm happy to answer any questions about any of this music or myself or anything else related to that in general. If, um, if anyone has anything to see, I, I didn't see anything in the, I couldn't see anything when I was sharing the screen. So I'm not sure if there's any, any notes accordingly, but. Carson, if you had to, if people weren't familiar with your music and you had to introduce them through 
through maybe one or two pieces? Is there anything that come to mind, whether it's something you talked about just now or not? That's a good question. It, it, it's hard to say because it just depends on what people are looking for. I mean, I, uh, that, the volume that has the nine preludes and fugues, I think, is a useful volume. Um, there's a variety of material in there that both longer things and shorter things. Um, uh, the third organ symphony that I mentioned is a piece that um, I'm quite fond of and has already had a pretty good performance uh, life. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's difficult to say. Some people are looking for hymn based material. Some people are, some people are not. I have, I've written many things on hymns, though I have far less of it than I think many composers uh, of organ music do, which is just my personal preference is always for original material. Um, and so I have written more of that than I have, um, though there are still probably well over 150 hymn, hymn based pieces. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? You can kind of, you can just unmute yourselves and ask them and if you think of them, we can always circle back later too. Carson, I, I'd be very curious uh, to know your process of 330 works is a lot of uh, opus numbers. So uh, what, what is your routine of composition and, and how do you decide what the next piece is going to be and how it will be framed and, and uh, so on? Um, when most, the vast majority of what I write comes about through commissions or specific projects. Um, and so in that case, I usually usually know a year or more in advance sort of what I need to be doing and when I need to be doing it. Um, and so that, that when the project's initially discussed, that sort of begins to lay out the parameters and start sort of percolating through the, through the ideas. And then I, I have a schedule for when, what sort of weeks I've allowed myself for the writing of any particular piece. And the, advan the advantage of the project being planned fairly far in advance is that there's a lot of mental time that's possible in the lead up to the actual writing. And then when it comes time to actually write it down, that part uh, often goes very quickly because so many of the details have, have previously have previously been, uh, been worked out. Um, I have written a lot of organ music, though, I, though it, I've written more actually other kinds of music as well. So, and, and for me as a composer in general, my interests are somewhat broad. So I, I, I like to mix up, mix up genres. I ideally am not following an organ piece with another one immediately, be it an orchestra piece or a chamber piece or choral work or something that's in a different genre right after one. And that's, um, for me, that, that keeps it, keeps me continually interested rather than just sort of trying to return to the same, uh, the same process again and again um but uh yeah do you write away from a keyboard or do you write yes out? yes i do uh for me composition and improvisation have never been connected um i know that's that's very atypical for composers who also play the organ for the vast majority it's a connected thing and, and I mean, I, that's not a value judgment one way or another. Everyone has to develop their own process. For me, they've always been very different things. Um, per, maybe that's because I write a lot of music that isn't organ music, isn't keyboard music at all. Um, so the composing is, is always done just at a desk away from a, away from a keyboard um, for me always. I think it also, since I'm spending plenty of time practicing and getting ready to perform concerts and things as well, I think for me it also it's a separation of, of just different things so that I'm not spending all my time in one place doing, doing one thing as well. Any other questions? And if not, we'll move over. I have just one more just out of curiosity. So what about greatest inspirations and, and influences in finding your own voice along the road? My, I mean, my world as a performer has always been entirely in the realm of contemporary music, um, 100%. And this, this sort of, it's always been my world, always been my interest. And so sort of inspiration, the inspiration for me is sort of being part of the larger community of what, of what music is existing today. And that, that's sort of what keeps me, it's what keeps me going back to practice and learn new pieces as a player by other people. And um, being part of that sort of larger stimulation is, I think, what, what keeps me interested in, in uh, composition as well, uh, certainly. Um, 
and so uh, so even though even though they are separate things, they're sort of it's all in the same brain, I guess. Um, and so that being a part of the new music world is sort of what what keeps me excited and keeps me the fact that there are exciting things that other people are doing that I can discover, and the fact that people seem to want what I'm doing. Those things together sort of um, are what I think is inspirational. And then just as a, you know, as a listener and, and lover of music and, and, and things, you know, there's sort of wide historical context and things that I, that I love. My world is, my world as a performer and, and composer is all new music, although I, I certainly love a lot of the historical things, even if, even if that's not my own, that's not my own performance life. Great, last call. Going in three, two, one. Great. Well, if you have any other questions, you know, type them in the chat or we can circle back later. But uh, right now, you're going to welcome Brenda. Let me spotlight you here. And there you are. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I think before, I'm sorry that my, my image is really blurry and I don't know why. I guess it's just the camera on my computer. But, um, before I talk about my music, I want to mention that some years ago I was doing some workshops on contemporary organ repertoire and I wanted to include some of Carson's music and not having played any of it to that point, I asked him a really unfair question and that was, um, if I had to choose one or two of your pieces to play in a workshop, what, what would you suggest? And he gave me a few options and um, so I ended up ordering volume nine of his music from Wayne Leopold and there's a, a diptych in there that works really nicely as paired as a prelude and a postlude and it's not terribly difficult but it's a very attractive piece and so that's the one that i've used usually when i do workshops like this um and there's also a sonatina in that volume that i've used that um that works really nicely on like a smaller two manual tracker organ so there you go there's my plug for for carson's music <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm Brenda Portman. I am in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm the resident organist at Hyde Park Community United Methodist Church, and um, uh, church music is my main job. I do some teaching of organ students, and composing is really sort of a side thing for me, um, something I never really knew I was going to do <laughs> years ago until it just sort of started happening and started turning out good, so I thought, hey, I'll just do this as long as it's turning out okay. Um, so um, I think, let's see, I'm going to share my screen. You, you have the handout and before I go to that, let me see if I can find, oh no, what has happened to my website? Uh, hang on a second. I lost that, okay. Here we go. So um, on my website, I've organized the organ music a little bit differently than I did on the handout. Um, I have at the top, I've just recently added a hymn tune directory so that if, if you wanted to look by hymn tune, that that would be easier to find pieces. Um, I've separated it. At the top, I have works that are more um, for concerts, but they're not they don't have to be just for concerts. Some of these are multiple movements and, and the individual movements can be used for um, preludes, postludes, voluntaries, whatever you want to call them. Um, and then farther down, I, I have a category for um, the shorter pieces and I've kind of arranged that by collection. So um, I have four books currently um, that are published by Sacred Music Press, which is where Carson is the editor. Um, so I've worked with him quite a bit on getting this to print. Um, just um, scrolling down, there are some shorter pieces also that are in some of the magazines that Lawrence puts out and then just some other random things. Um, and I do have recordings as well of almost everything. So I invite you to check out whatever you are interested in, in, in listening to on your own. Um, and so the handout, let me, let me get out of screen share so I can go back to that. Um, uh, 
I have done this by collection and then I've made my best attempt at, at I guess on um, difficulty level, which for me is hard to guess because I, in contrast to what Carson said, I do write mostly at the keyboard. And so as I'm writing something, I'm playing it a lot. And so by the end of writing the piece, I have learned the whole thing. And so I no longer have a sense for how hard it will be for someone to learn it starting from scratch. So these are just my guesses um, from one to five, one being the easiest and five being the most advanced. And um, this is just a range for my own music. I would not say by any means that five is the hardest thing that's ever been written for the organ. Um, it's just the hardest thing that I've written for the organ. And it might be, I mean, I, I, obviously I can play all of this, but fours and fives are things that I would have to put a bit of time into before I could perform it or record it. Um, so um, this first collection is the first one that was uh, published and this is mostly um, shorter pieces that could be postludes. The second one is preludes and does include Elegy, which was um, the winner of a, a composition competition in the Twin Cities. And these next two are really recent, um, the, an Advent and Christmas collection, as well as one that is primarily concert music, which includes the Prelude and Tarantel, which was um, commissioned for the AGO convention that didn't happen as planned, but happened virtually. Um, um, and also on this, this handout is everything that is currently published. And my website includes everything that I have finished. So some of those things are not published yet, but eventually will be. Um, Again, just scrolling through, there's a lot, most of everything is two, three, or four in terms of difficulty. And then um, going back to some of these multiple movement pieces, I have a range, so they might range from three to five, like one movement might be a five and other, other movements might be three. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the whole thing is really hard. There just might be some part that is more difficult. Um, so I guess I am going to just show some scores from each of these collections. Um, I also have a hard time picking favorites, and so I'm gonna go off of some other people that I know what their favorites are. Um, and this first one here, um, the March on the Old Hundred Psalm tune, one of my students insisted on doing this on his senior recital. Um, so I thought that might be a good one to show. Um, it's just a, a march and with some flourishes and things, the, the melody, it, it kind of wanders through some different, um, like a circle fifth kind of progression through a few keys. The melody is slightly embellished in a trumpet solo at the beginning. Nice if you have a, a fanfare trumpet on your organ, but not does not have to be on that. Um, and then just goes through some interlude material and eventually returns to that melody that we all know and the second time let's see if i can find it um is not on the trumpet but just a, a fuller and broader um sound on the organ so um and then ends with just some flourish and pedal and that's that one um one other piece from that same book is the toccata on Aberystwyth. um a colleague of mine who now lives in St. Louis, but used to live here in Cincinnati. She does a lot of, her name is Sarah Bereza. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly and if any of you know her, but she does a lot of blogging and podcasting about church music. And she has, um, one of her blogs is her top 25 organ post lids of all time. And this piece made that list. So I was kind of excited about that. Um, and it's really just kind of this, these triplet figurations as, as the um, Takata Configurations and the uh, melody comes in in the right hand, sort of rhythmically offset with the triplets and just one phrase at a time with the triplets as, as interludes. And so it's about a three minute piece and so you hear the melody really only one time throughout. Um, Not a lot to say there. Okay. Um, 
then the from the Peace Like a River book, the Prelude Collection. This is a meditation on Finlandia. Um, some of you know that we have a concert series at my church and we are attempting to continue this year with some virtual concerts and one is the first one is next Sunday we're having Rhonda Sider Edgington and she's playing a program of all living women composers and so she had picked this piece to play as part of that I think she's just trying to be nice because the most the other pieces on this program are way more interesting than this but um, this is just um, kind of simple with strings at the beginning. The pedal has the melody on a four foot stop. And throughout this section, then, um, then I, I seem to like triplets. I guess you see this a lot in my music, but then we start with um, like a harmonic flute stop on the grate. And that brings in the melody for a second time. And that's just kind of buried in among the triplets and this just a nice feature of the flutes and the strings of the organ. Um, and that piece is, it's about, it's close to four minutes long. Um, and then the other one from that collection, this is Elegy. This is the first piece in the collection. And um, I think this may have been the first piece that I really tried to write without using any hymn tune. and again kind of surprised myself that it turned out okay um as um, lush strings at the beginning um has a middle section that goes into b major and has a melody on a, an eight foot principle more triplets surprise <laughs> um and then returns eventually to a little bit of double pedal in there the counter melody um, eventually returns to the opening idea with the strings again and closes quietly there's the end okay um, the Christmas book is, has not had a lot of performances yet, so I just picked a couple um, that I enjoy. This is there's a triptych on the hymn tune Helmsley, which is one of my favorites for the Advent season. And lo, he comes with clouds descending, and um, this fanfare sort of opening motive is the first four notes anyway are taken. This arpeggiated figure is com comes from the first four notes of the hymn tune. And this piece is only about two minutes long, but then there's a, two more movements to go with it, a versus and a toccata. And um, I do like occasionally to use changing and mixed meters at, for rhythmic interest. I, I have a lot of background in playing in wind ensembles in high school and college, and wind ensemble music has a lot of meter changes, ir irregular, meters and I just came to really enjoy that um, so that does creep into my music every so often um, so here's the where the, the melody of the hymn comes in um, except going up to the upper octave instead of down G B D and then it would come back to, to G um, for the hymn and definitely some rhythmic variations in there um, and just like really short one to two measure interludes between each of the phrases of the hymn so that in that two minutes, it, you again are hearing the melody just once through. Um, and that is the end of that one. Um, to contrast a little bit, my setting of It Came Upon a Midnight Clear um, is just really um, kind of light and almost like angel wings, perhaps, on eight and two and two and two thirds flutes in the manual, and the melody in longer notes on a four foot stop in the pedal. And it looks like it would be fast, it's really not meant to be hurried at all, it can be whatever sort of tempo feels um, relaxed. And it really just this sort of figuration all the way through, but some hemiola type of figures here that give it again some rhythmic interest. 
and something that doesn't use strings. <laughs> Some, several of the other pieces were using the strings, so this is a different, different sound. Um, yep. Yeah. And then let me move to the, the final book. I was going to show you um, part of the Genevan Suite, which is a four movement suite that I wrote based on different tunes from the Genevan Psalter. And this actually was just performed uh, a couple days ago by Wyatt Smith out at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. And um, he said that his the last movement was his favorite. That's the one that uses the probably the most familiar tune that we know as comfort, comfort, now my people. Um, but I wanted to show these middle movements that sort of took shape in homage to a couple of composers. Bert Mater is a Dutch composer who I studied quite a bit when I was doing my lecture recital for my DMA. And this, uh, he used various minimalistic techniques and this piece is really like takes almost exact the, exactly the form of some of his pieces, or at least the ones that I had studied. Um, and so it starts with the chorale in just a simple four part setting. And then it goes into some minimalistic figures that um, are kind of uneven rhythmically so that you never quite know where the downbeat is. And throughout that figuration, then you have the, the chorale melody stated again, one phrase at a time. Um, and again, these, these figurations keep altering. Sometimes there's seven notes in it. The, the, the standard is seven notes, but sometimes there's only five, sometimes there's nine, something you, you've added more. And so it just always feels a little irregular. Um, and so then when we get to the end, Oh, and then there's a middle section that gets a little bit louder and has some cannon between the left hand and the the pedal for wherever the whatever the middle phrase of the chorale is. And then to finish the chorale, it returns to the original figuration. Um, and then the final section is another, you guys hear it here, another simple four-part chorale, but now with the melody in the tenor voice instead. So um, again, very, very similar in form to what he has done. And I just inserted a different chorale and kind of made it work in that form. Um, and, and this one, I wasn't really trying to copy anybody, but as I wrote it, I realized it sounded a lot like the Piece Salvation is Created by Chesnikov and just sort of that, that Russian choral music feel. And so this just takes um, the different phrases of this particular psalm tune and it, it kind of, they're not always in the right order. They're kind of mixed up here and there. Um, but just this, a really warm eight foot sound on three different manuals, slightly at different dynamic levels, but all basically eight foot sound. Um, pardon me while my cat jumps on the table here. Um, and then the final movement is the that comfort, comfort ye my people starts with a, a trumpet fanfare and the, the melody is first seen in the pedal as a pedal solo. Um, and it's similar to a staccata, I guess. Um, Pedal again, and the trumpet comes back, and then we have um, a more steady rhythmic setting of that um, psalm tune in, in four four, which is not how you normally sing it, um, but just that kind of then moves into a toccata and concludes with. Um, that, well, a little bit more pedal solo and then, and then the trumpet comes back at the end to finish the piece. Um, so that is, I think, everything I had planned to show you. Um, get out of screen sharing.
And then I guess I would see if anybody has questions. Sort of like what I asked Carson, do you have a piece that you're um, most proud of maybe that you want would want people to check out, whether it was one of those or not? Um, I guess I'm more proud of the more substantial pieces. So possibly the uh, most recent collection called Horizons that has some concert music in it. Um, for the fantasy on Ubi Caritas, that was actually commissioned by Carson and um, Monument and yeah, the Geneva Suite and then the other piece, the Prairie in Tarantale, which was for the convention. So these, those are some of my larger pieces. Any other questions? I think, are you, do you guys want to talk about it all? The uh, sort of composer, publisher, dynamic at all or no? Carson can do that. Yeah. No, no, sure, sure we can. Yeah, so as I mean, as we've been saying, I, I've been responsible for the publications um, of Brenda's collections that we've talked about here. Um, and my role is, is besides sort of technical editing things that happen is, is to sort of help bring the concept to shape and discuss it. I remember when we started, the, the, that first book of postlets came about, um, Brenda had sent me a pile of things that we were sort of looking at in general, and there were, I think, three postludes. And I thought, what about developing some more of these to be, to be a, a collection? And so, and then after that book, it was like, well, that's a loud book. The next book needs to be, needs to be the companion quiet uh, group of pieces. So, so that, and then, and then at some point it, it became clear there were a number of Christmas pieces. And then at another, another point, uh, we focused that, hori that last Horizons book that she was mentioning, the primary impetus was focused around the commission piece for the convention slash uh, organ fest. Um, and given the given that that piece was a little more a little more advanced um, in difficulty than some of the other things, it seemed like it seemed to make sense to to group that with with several of the other more concert oriented pieces that had collected up over the years. So the point the point from the publisher side is to try and make each book have a sort of interesting, coherent, useful uh, shape and context uh, type shape and context to it. Um, is that I don't know if there were other questions, Jim, you had about? No, I didn't have anything specific. I mean, it, it, from a, it's sort of, it's a different, it's just ever working, different composers from an editorial side, different composers work in different ways and dealing, dealing with them and that relationship is, is, you know, is different for every person. Some people are, some, some people, um, some people it's an extremely hands-on process along the way. Some people it's, it's more once the things are done and sort of refinement and, and uh, developing and sort of every person is different. So every, you know, every, every project ends up, ends up being a little bit different that way. Well, this can be sort of, for both of you, do you, in your experience, do you, um, is it more common to, to get, to hear from your publisher to say, we need this, can you write this? Or I, I've written this, can we publish this? And do you have a preference of kind of how that all works? From the, I mean, from the editorial side, I things have happened both ways. I've had people sort of pitch projects that have ended up being things, and then I've also gone to people and said things. And as I said, sometimes it's a matter of just sort of providing the glue that ties the concept together. They may already have some of the pieces. It's like we need a few more of these, or let's group these with these, or or um, whichever. Which which can be a hard thing to see if you're the person that wrote the piece. Um, and I I think about that from the other side of the table as well. Sometimes it's it's just useful to have someone else look at it and say, this belongs with this or or let's save that for this um, for this other this other sort of thing. Brenda, do you have any thoughts on um, I guess I've done it both ways as well, but I know um, it's helpful to me if um, Carson or a publisher will give me ideas of what they can use, um, what's going to be useful to their audience, because, you know, we don't know that otherwise. And I've, I've, you know, with my choral music, I have sent 
different pieces to different publishers, really just trying to give my best guess as to what fits their sort of image or their typical sound or whatever. Um, and I don't always get any feedback on what they're looking for. So, you know, sometimes it's yes, we'll take this and other times it's no. And they're not saying that it's bad, but what was happening? I'm hearing noise. Um, but if, if they are able to provide guidance on, you know, what sorts of things they're looking for, then it helps me anyway to be able to write <laughs> the kind of music that is going to then be useful to those who are looking for it um, instead of me just writing whatever I feel like writing. I mean, I guess if, if it's useful to me, then it's still worth writing because I can use it with my own job. And um, if I'm, you know, if there's a certain hymn tune coming up in a few weeks that we're going to sing and I don't have any settings of it that I like, then I might, um, okay, I can see the cat in my screen, oh gosh. <laughs> Um, then I might write something for myself to use, but if, if somebody else can use it as well, then that's even better. So. There's no shame in animals. My dog has been sitting on my lap. This <laughs> uh, looks like Michael has a question in the comments. I guess this could be for either of you. Can you comment on streaming issues for these pieces or from the publisher's perspective in general? I assume he means for kind of live stream worship services and stuff like that. Well, I do know for mine that anything that's published with Lorenz, if you have, um, it's either one license or the, the CCLI, which the counterpart is a uh, Christian copyright solutions, CCS, either one of those, you know, Lorenz is going to be covered. So anything in here is acceptable to stream. Yeah. Yeah. Assuming you have their streaming podcast option. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just submit them on your report. Um, these days that's true of the vast majority of people publishing, um, organ music and those that haven't thought about this before have been um, getting into it pretty quickly in the last coming months, obviously, with um, more and more things streaming now. And I'm sure even even eventually once more live events start happening, I suspect some places will probably continue to stream events as well um, for the additional coverage that brings. But there's certainly almost always a way. Are there any publishers in mind that you know of that do have issues that maybe people should know to avoid or are most major publishers covered under those? Yeah, most major publishers are going to have a, have a relationship. I mean, I, at least the kinds of things that most people in this country are finding and playing in church. Some of the, I mean, a lot of what I do in my performing life is in sort of strange byways of European music and things. And some of those would not be naturally covered by streaming licenses here because there's so many differences in general. But that's not, that's not a situation most people are going to run into playing for church. Anybody else have any other questions for either of them? I have one. Um, I was just wondering if uh, both of you um, might speak a little bit about um, composing for organ and instrument. Um, if that's something that's of interest these days. I know, for example, um, Brenda has a really nice setting of St. Columba for piano and trumpet that I personally use um, and that our trumpeter likes a great deal. So I just wondered if, especially in this time of COVID, if that's something that um, either of you have thought about expanding. Yeah, I mean, I, I from my end, I, I have written a number of pieces for organ instrument over the years. People have commissioned things. Um, from a sort of publisher market perspective, it's not an enormous area. They don't they don't sell that well, um, no matter what they are. It's just it's not a big market compared to choral music or solo music. Um, so I think in some ways that's I think the reluctance of publishers to throw too much at it uh, from that end. Even if right now maybe people are using more. Um, that still doesn't change market dynamics. The same thing has happened right now with vocal solos. Everyone's sort of thinking, oh, there's this enormous market for vocal solos, and there's not actually. There's, there's, there hasn't been a market in the sense of what the market means for sacred vocal solos for years, which is why almost no one publishes them. They, they simply can't pay for themselves. 
Um, that doesn't mean no one's using them, but it doesn't, it doesn't make sense on a commercial level to, to balance the numbers. And that's true even now, even, even with uh, churches. It's, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's, um, it just means that people have to find other ways to publish that material. So um, I think there are some sorts of things. We, we're developing a Trump, we have a trumpet organ multi-composer book that's coming. Brenda's written a few pieces for it, as have um, four or five other composers that, that should happen sometime. Um, next year, depending on things. So there are there are things that sort of carefully can be pursued, at least from the from the sort of market side. And then, in a more general sense, sort of composers tend to write what people commission or ask them to write. So that's certainly how nearly all of my instrumental and organ things have come about. Um, Do either of you have any uh, projects? coming up that you're excited about that we should be on the lookout for? Organ or not? Uh, well, I guess one commission I'm working on right now is for the dedication of a pasty organ that's gonna be in Arlington, Virginia. And they've asked me to write a two movement piece that is actually inspired by their stained glass windows that are also going to be restored at the same time as the organ project. Um, so that's kind of my bigger thing that I'm working on right now. Um, I have, I guess, various things in progress. Probably the most, the biggest one, my most recent oratorio um, was recorded um, last month for CD. Um, in London that should be out uh, next year. And that's a, that's a big evening long piece that I'm excited about having, having out there. So piece is long done obviously, but can't be heard until it's recorded really. Great, well, we need to kind of wrap up in a minute here, but we have a last call for questions if there are any out there. Going once, twice. So, well, thank you both so much for spending your evening with us here, um, giving us a lot of good stuff to look out for. Um, if anybody needs, wants the um, documents they had, they're on Facebook and on the eBlast. And if you can't find them, just email AGO Houston Events at Gmail, and I'll send you a copy. Um, and I look out for our virtual student virtual recital next month. So, um, thank you both so much again. Thank you. All right, well, everyone take care and we will see you soon. <laughs>